Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today, we are going to explore a little more of Israel Rigardi. I have brought up Israel Rigardi before when he did an amazing essay on Neville Goddard. He was close friends with Neville Goddard. Many of you may have heard of Israel Rigardi in relation to Alistair Crowley. When I posted that episode, I had people concerned that he was satanic or something. Israel Rigardi is a very fascinating character in the history of new thought and magic and a variety of disciplines, including the Kabbalah and understanding old occult societies. And I find some of his writings completely fascinating. His discussion of the middle pillar when applied is absolutely real and has been discussed in so many other books. And so I'm very interested in some of his writing. I found a really fantastic little booklet that he wrote called The Art of True Healing. And it's going to talk about the untapped centers and rhythm and breathing and how to access these centers through thought, color, and sound. And it has some very, very particular recommendations that when utilized can enhance your ability to pray and visualize. Israel Gardi is super fascinating just by the people that he hung out with. He was actually a friend of Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson. Check out my previous episode on that. Christopher Hyatt. And he was regarded in the counterculture of the 60s. He attempted to bring about the secret teachings of the Golden Dawn and did write a book about Aleister Crowley and worked essentially as his assistant for a short period of time. But he did acknowledge Aleister Crowley's faults, and he was not any sort of evil Satanist, just a collector of information. And his work on ceremonial magic is incredibly interesting to read about. This particular work is applicable to anything and is very, very powerful. And I thought would really enhance our ability to understand healing and our bodies. The Art of True Healing by Israel Rigardi. One, within every man and woman is a force which directs and controls the entire course of life. Properly used, it can heal every affliction and ailment to which mankind is heir. Every single religion affirms this fact. All forms of mental or spiritual healing, no matter under what name, they travel, promise the same thing. Even psychoanalysis employs this power, though indirectly using the now popular word libido, for the critical insight and understanding which it brings to bear upon the psych releases tensions of various kinds. And through this release, the healing power latent within and natural to the human system operates more freely. Each of these systems undertakes to teach its devotees technical methods of thinking or contemplation or prayer such as will according to the a priori terms of their own philosophies, renew their bodies, and transform their whole environment. None or few of them, however, actually fulfill in a complete way the high promise made at the outset. There seems but little understanding of the practical means whereby the spiritual forces underlying the universe and permeating the entire nature of man may be utilized and directed towards the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Naturally, without universal cooperation, such an ideal is impossible for all mankind. Nevertheless, each one for himself may commence the task of reconstruction. The crucial question then is how are we to become aware of this force? What are its nature and properties? What is the mechanism whereby we can use it? Untapped currents. As I have said before, different systems have evolved widely differing processes by which the student might divine the presence of such a power. Meditation, prayer, invocation, emotional exaltation, and demands made at random upon the universe or the universal mind have been a few 
of such methods. In the last resort, if we ignore petty details of a trivial nature, all have this in common. By turning the fiery, penetrating power of the mind inwards upon itself and exalting the emotional system to a certain pitch, we may become aware of previously unsuspected currents of force. Currents, moreover, almost electric in their interior sensation, healing and integrating in their effect. It is the willed use of such a force that is capable of bringing health to body and mind. When directed, it acts magnet-like, by this I mean that it attracts to whomsoever employs these methods just those necessities of life, material or spiritual, that he urgently requires or which are needed for his further evolution. Fundamentally, the underlying idea of the mental healing systems is this. In the ambient atmosphere surrounding us and pervading the structure of each minute body cell, is a spiritual force. This force is omnipresent and infinite. It is present in the most infinitesimal object, as it is in the most proportion staggering nebula or island universe. It is this force which is life itself. Nothing in the vast expanse of space is dead. Everything pulsates with vibrant life. Even the ultra-microscopic particles of the atom are alive. In fact, the electron is a crystallization of its electric power. This life force, being infinite, it follows that man must be saturated, permeated, through and through with spiritual force. It constitutes his higher self. It is his link with Godhead. It is God in man. Every molecule in his physical system must be soaked with its dynamic energy. Each cell in the body contains it in its plenitude. Thus we are brought face to face with the enormous problem underlying all disease, the enigmatical problem of nervous depletion. What is fatigue? How can there be depletion if vitality and cosmic currents of force daily pour through man, simply saturating his mind and body with its power? Primarily, it is because he offers so much resistance to its flow through him that he becomes tired and ill. The conflict finally culminating in death. How is puny man able to defy the universe? Nay more, offer resistance and opposition to the very force which underlies and continually evolves in the universe. The complacency and confusion of his mental outlook, the moral cowardice by which he was reared, and his false perception of the nature of life, these are the causes of resistance to the inward flow of the spirit. That this is unconscious is no logical obstacle to the force of this argument as all the depth psychologies have demonstrated. What man is really aware of all the involuntary processes going on within him? Who is conscious of the intricate mechanism of his mental processes, of that by which his food is assimilated and digested, of the circulation of his blood, of the arterial distribution of nourishment to every bodily organ? All these are purely involuntary processes to a large degree, so are his resistances to life. Man has surrounded himself with a crystallized shell of prejudices and ill-conceived fantasies, an armor which affords no entrance to light of life without. What wonder he ails? What wonder is he so ill and impotent, helpless and poor? Why should there be surprise that the average individual is so unable to deal with life? The first two steps to health, the first step towards freedom and health is a conscious realization of the vast spiritual reservoir in which we live and move and have our being. Repeated intellectual effort to make this part and parcel of one's mental outlook upon life automatically breaks down 
or dissolves something of the hard, inflexible shell of the mind. And then life and spirit pour abundantly. Health spontaneously arises and a new life begins as the point of view undergoes this radical change. Moreover, it would appear that the environment attracts just those people who can help in various ways and precisely those amenities of life that had been longed for. The second step lies in a slightly different direction. Regulated breathing, quite a simple process, its necessity follows from the following postulate. If life is all about one, all penetrating, and all pervasive, what more reasonable than that the very air we breathe from one moment to another should be highly charged with vitality? Our breathing processes we therefore regulate accordingly. We contemplate that life is the active principle in the atmosphere. During the practice of this rhythmical breathing at fixed periods of the day, there should be no strenuous forcing of the mind, no overtaxing of the will. We let the breath flow in while mentally counting very slowly, one, two, three, four. Then we exhale, counting the same beat. It is fundamental and important that the initial rhythm, whether it be a four or a 10 beat, count or any other convenient one should be maintained. For it is the very rhythm itself, which is responsible for the easy absorption of vitality from without and the acceleration of the divine power within rhythm. Immutable rhythm is everywhere manifest in the universe. It is a living process whose parts move and are governed in accordance with the cyclic laws. Look at the sun, the stars, and the planets. All move with comparable grace, with a rhythm in their inexorable times. It is only mankind that has wandered in its ignorance and self-complacency far from the divine cycles of things. We have interfered with the rhythmic process inherent in nature, and how sadly have we paid for it. Therefore, in attempting to attune ourselves once more to the intelligent spiritual power functioning through nature's mechanism, we attempt not blindly to copy, but intelligently to adopt her methods. Make therefore the breathing rhythmical at certain fixed times of the day, when there is little likelihood of disturbance, cultivate above all the art of relaxation. Learn to address each tensed muscle from toe to head as you lie flat on your back in bed. Tell it deliberately to loosen its tension and cease from its unconscious contracture. Think of the blood in response to your command flowing copiously to each organ, carrying life and nourishment everywhere, producing a state of glowing radiant health. Only after these preliminary processes have been accomplished should you begin your rhythmic breathing, slowly and without haste. Gradually, as the mind accustoms itself to the idea, the lungs will take up the rhythm spontaneously. In a few minutes, it will have become automatic. The whole process then becomes extremely simple and pleasurable. It would be impossible to overestimate its importance or efficacy. As the lungs take up the rhythm, automatically inhaling and exhaling to a measured beat, so do they communicate it and gradually extend it to all the surrounding cells and tissue. Just as a stone thrown into a pool sends out widely expanding ripples and concentric circles of motion. In a few minutes, the whole body is vibrating in unison with their movement. Every cell seems to vibrate sympathetically, and very soon the whole organism comes to feel as if it were an inexhaustible storage battery of power. The sensation, and it must be a sensation, is unmistakable. Simple as it is, the exercise is not to be despised. It is upon the mastery of this very easy technique that the rest of this system stands. Master it first. Make sure that you can completely relax and then produce the rhythmic breath in a few seconds. Mental and spiritual centers. I now approach an idea 
fundamental and highly significant it is the inability to realize or thoroughly to have grasped its importance which really underlies the frequently observed failure of many mental culture and spiritual healing systems just as in the physical body are specialized organs for the performance of specialized functions so in the mental and spiritual nature exists corresponding centers and organs exactly as the teeth the stomach liver and intestines are so many mechanisms evolved and devised by nature for the digestion and assimilation of food so are there similar centers in the other constituents of man's nature the mouth receives food digestion occurs in the stomach and small intestines likewise there is an apparatus for rejecting waste effete products in the psychic nature also are focal centers for the absorption of spiritual power from the universe without others render its distribution and circulation possible the dynamic energy and power entering man from without is not uniform or like in vibratory rate it may be of too high a voltage so to say readily to be endured by him within therefore is a certain psychic apparatus whereby indiscriminate cosmic currents of energy may be assimilated and digested their voltage thus becoming stepped down or adjusted to the human level the process of becoming aware of this psychic apparatus and using the energy it generates is an integral part of this healing system it is my contention that prayer and contemplative methods unconsciously employ these inner centers hence we would be wiser and far more efficient deliberately to employ for our own ends this spiritual power and the centers it flows through let us call these latter for the moment psycho spiritual organs of which there are five major ones since name them we must inasmuch as the human mind loves to classify and tabulate things let me give them the most non-committal and non-compromising titles imaginable so that no system of prejudice may be erected thereon for convenience's sake the first we may name spirit the second air the succeeding ones being called fire water and earth to illustrate the concept i reproduce a simple diagram it shows the position and location of the centers not for one moment do i wish to be understood as stating that these centers are physical in nature and position though there may be glandular parallelisms they exist in a subtler spiritual or psychic part of man's nature we may even consider them not as realities themselves but as symbols of realities great redeeming and saving symbols under certain conditions we may become aware of them in very much the same way as we may become aware of different organs in our physical bodies we often speak of reason as being situated in the head referring emotion to the heart and instinct in the belly similarly there exists a natural correspondence between these centers and various parts of the body thought color and sound it is axiomatic to the system that there are three principal engines or means whereby we may become aware of the centers to awaken them from their dormant state so that it may function properly within thought color and sound are the three means the mind must concentrate itself on the assumed position of these centers one by one then certain names which are to be considered as vibratory rates must be intoned and vibrated finally each center is to be visualized as having a particular color and shape the combination of these three agencies gradually awakens the centers from their latency slowly they become stimulated into functioning each according to its own nature pouring forth a stream of highly spiritualized energy and power into the body and mind when ultimately their operation becomes habitual and stabilized the spiritual power they generate may be directed by will to heal various ailments and diseases both of a psychological and physical nature it can also be communicated by mere laying of hands to another person simply by thinking fixedly and with intent the energy moreover can be communicated from mind to mind telepathically or transmitted through space to another person miles away objects in space affording no interruption or obstacle to its passage the illustration used is the illustration for the middle pillar 
with the earth at the feet, water at the groin, fire at the heart, air at the throat, spirit above the head. The Coronal Sphere First of all, the position of the centers as shown must be memorized. There are to be stimulated into activity either while sitting upright or whilst lying down flat on the back in a perfectly relaxed state. The hands may be folded in the lap or else with fingers interlocked be permitted to rest loosely below the solar plexus. Calmness of mind should be induced and several minutes devoted to rhythmic breathing should result in the sensation of gentle ripple playing over the diaphragm. Then imagine above the coronal region of the head a ball or sphere of brilliant white light. Do not force the imagination to visualize the light sphere. To force would only result in the development of neuromuscular tension, and this would defeat our end. Let it be done quietly and easily. If the mind wanders, as indeed it will, wait a moment or two and gently lead it back. At the same time, vibrate or intone the word ehye, pronounced ehye. After a few days of practice, it will become quite easy to imagine the name vibrating above the head in the so-called spirit center. This is the indwelling or overshadowing divinity in each of us, the basic spiritual self, which we can all draw upon. Ehie means literally I am, and this center represents the I am consciousness within. The effect of thus mentally directing the vibration is to awaken the center to dynamic activity. When once it begins to vibrate and rotate light and are felt to emanate downwards upon and into the personality, enormous charges of spiritual power make their way into the brain and the entire body feels suffused with vitality and life. Even the fingertips and toes react to the awakening of the coronal sphere by a faint pricking sensation at first being felt. The name should be intoned during the first few weeks of practice in a moderately audible and sonorous tone of voice. As skill is acquired, then the vibration may be practiced in silence, the name being imagined and mentally placed in the center. If the mind tends to wonder, the frequent repetition of the vibration will be found a great help to concentration. The air center. Having let the mind rest here for some five minutes, when it will be seen to glow and scintillate, imagine that it emits a white shaft downwards through the skull and brain, stopping at the throat. Here it expands to form a second ball of light, which should include a large part of the face up to and including the eyebrows. If the larynx is conceived to be the center of the sphere, then the distance from it to the cervical vertebra at the back of the neck will be approximately the radius. Naturally, this dimension will vary with different people. A similar technique should be pursued with this sphere, which we named the air center. As obtained with the previous one, it should be strongly and vividly formulated as a scintillating sphere of brilliant white light shining and glowing from within. The name to be vibrated is Yeowa Elohim, pronounced Yeowa Elohim. A part or two may not be amiss at this point with regard to the names. In reality, they are names ascribed in various parts of the Old Testament to God. The variety and variation of these names are attributed to different divine functions. When acting in a certain manner, he is described by the biblical scribes by one name. When doing something else, another name more appropriate to his action is used. The system I am describing now has its roots in the Hebrew mystical tradition. Its ancient innovators were men of exalted religious aspirations and genius. It is only to be expected to that a religious bias was projected by them into the scientific psychological system. But it must be explained that for our present day purposes, no religious connotation is implied by my use of these biblical divine names. Anyone can use them without subscribing in the least to the ancient religious views, whether he be a Jew, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, or atheist. 
It is a purely empirical system which is successful despite the skepticism or faith of the operator. We today may consider those sacred names in any entirely different and practical light. They are keynotes of different constituents of man's nature, doorways to so many levels of that part of the psyche of which normally we are unconscious. They are vibratory rates or symbolic signatures of the psychophysical centers we are describing. Their use as vibratory keynotes awakens into activity the centers which their rate is in sympathy, conveying to our consciousness some recognition of the several levels of the unconscious spiritual side of our personalities. Hence, the actual religious significance does not concern us, nor their literal translation. To refer back to the air center in the throat, let the vibratory sounds be intoned a number of times until its existence is recognized and clearly felt as a definite sensory experience. There is no mistaking the sensations of its awakening. About the same length of time should be spent formulating it and the succeeding centers as was devoted to the contemplation of the coronal sphere. This period having elapsed, let it thrust downward from itself with the aid of imagination a shaft of light. The Fire Center Descending to the region of the solar plexus, just beneath the sternum breastbone, the shaft expands once again to form a third sphere. This is the position of the fire center. The allocation of fire to the center is particularly appropriate for the heart is notoriously associated with the emotional nature, with love and the higher feelings. How often do we not speak of ardent passion and the flame of love and so forth? The diameter of this ambient cardiac sphere should be such as to extend from the front of the body to the back. Here vibrate the name Yeowa Eloa Vadaoth, pronounced Yeowa Eloa Vadaoth. Take care that the intonation vibrates well within the formulated white sphere. If this is done, at once a radiation of warmth will be felt to emanate from the center, genuinely stimulating all the parts and organs about it. Some students have complained that the above divine name is unduly long and difficult to pronounce. After some experimentation, I have substituted the Gnostic name Ayao for the Hebrew word. Both are attributed Kabbalistically to the Sephira of Tifereth on the Tree of Life, and so are equally valid. I have found it to be every bit as effective as the Hebrew name, and in my own practice of this meditation, I have permanently substituted the one for the other. Io is pronounced as in ki, eow, eow, slowly with vigor. In point of fact, it is simpler to vibrate this name than almost any other, and the vibration it produces is clear and strong. Since the mind functions in and through the body, being coextensive with it, the mental and emotional faculties likewise become stimulated by the dynamic flow of energy from the centers. The hard and fast barrier erected between consciousness and the unconscious, an armored partition which impedes our free expression and hinders spiritual development, slowly becomes dissolved. As time goes on and the practice continues, it may disappear completely and the personality gradually achieve integration and wholeness. Thus health spreads to every function of mind and body and happiness ensues as a permanent blessing. The Water Center Continue the shaft downwards from the solar plexus to the pelvic region, the region of the generative organs. Here too, a radiant sphere is to be visualized approximately of the same dimension as the higher one. Here also is a name to be intoned so as to produce a rapid vibration in the cells and molecules of the tissue in that region. Shaddai El Kai is pronounced Shaddai El Kai. The mind must be permitted to dwell on the imaginative formulation for some minutes, visualizing the sphere as of white brilliance. In each time the mind wanders from a, such a brilliance at as at the beginning it is bound to do, let it gently be coaxed back by repeated and powerful vibrations of the name. It may be feared that this practice could awaken or stimulate sexual feeling and emotion unnecessarily. In those in whom a sexual conflict is raging, such an apprehension is just and legitimate. Actually, however, the fear is groundless, 
for the contemplation of the water center as a sphere of white light connected by a shaft to the higher and more spiritual centers acts rather in a more sedative way. And in point of fact, sexual stimulation can be removed not by ignorant and short-sighted repression, but by the circulation of such energies through the system by means of this practice, a thoroughgoing and far-reaching process of sublimation. Alchemical, almost in effect, may thus be instigated. This is not to be construed as legitimizing the avoidance of the sexual problem. The Earth Center. The final step is once more to visualize the shaft descending from the reproductive sphere, moving downwards through the thighs and legs until it strikes the feet. There it expands from a point approximately beneath the ankle and forms a fifth sphere. We have named this one the Earth Center. Let the mind formulate here exactly as before, a brilliant, dazzling sphere, the same size as the others, vibratory the name Adonai Haaretz, as Adonai Haaretz, several minutes having been utilized in awakening the center by fixed and steady thought and by repeated vibration of the name. Pause for a short while. Then try to visualize clearly the entire shaft of silvery light studied as it were with five gorgeous diamonds of incomparable brilliance stretching from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet. But a few minutes will suffice to give reality to this concept, bringing about a vivid realization of the powerful forces which playing upon the personality are eventually assimilated into the psychophysical system after their transformation and passage through the imaginative centers, the combination of rhythmic breathing with the willed visualization of the decent power through the light shaft or middle pillar, as it is also called, produces by far the best results. Color correspondences, as skill and familiarity are acquired in the formulation of the centers, an addition to the technique may be made. Earlier, I remarked that color was a very important consideration where this technique was concerned. Each center has a different color attribution, though it is wisest for a long period of time to refrain from using any other color than white. To the spirit or coronal center, the color white is attributed. It is the color of purity, spirit, divinity, and so on. It represents not so much a human constituent, but a universal and cosmic principle overshadowing the whole of mankind. As we descend the shaft, however, the colors change. Lavender is attributed to the air or throat center, and it represents particularly the mental faculties, human consciousness as such. To the fire center, red is an obvious association requiring no further comment. Blue is the color referred to the water center. It is the color of peace, calmness, and tranquility concealing enormous strength and virility. In other words, its peace is the peace of strength and power rather than the inertia of mere weakness. Finally, the color referred to the lowest center of earth is russet, the rich deep color of the earth itself, the foundation upon which we rest. From this very brief and concise summary, it will be seen that each of these centers has a species of affinity or sympathy with a different or spiritual constituent. One center is peculiarly sympathetic to or is associated with the emotions and feelings, whilst another has definitely an intellectual bias. Hence it follows logically and experience demonstrates this fact that their equilibrated activity and stimulation evokes a sympathetic reaction from every part of man's nature. And where disease manifesting in the body is directly due to some psychic maladjustment or infirmity, then the activity of the appropriate center must be affected somehow in a deleterious way. Its stimulation by sound and color tends to stimulate the corresponding psychic principle and thus to disperse the maladjustment. Sooner or later, a reaction is induced physically in the disappearance of the disease and the consequent building up of new cells and tissue, the appearance of health itself. Two we approach a further and important stage in the development of the middle pillar technique. Having brought power and spiritual energy into the system by means of the psycho-spiritual centers, how best are we to use it? That is to say, use it in such a way that every single cell, every atom and every organ becomes stimulated and vitalized 
by that dynamic stream. To begin with, we throw the mind upwards to the coronal sphere again, imagining it to be in a state of vigorous activity. That is, it revolves rapidly absorbing spiritual energy from space about it, transforming it in such a way that it becomes available for immediate use in any human activity. Imagine then that such transformed energy flows, stream-like, down the left side of the head, down the left side of the trunk, and the left leg. While the current is descending, the breath should slowly be exhaled to a convenient rhythm. With the slow inhalation of the breath, imagine the vital current passes from the sole of the left foot to the right foot and gradually ascends the right side of the body. In this way, it returns to the source from which it issued, the coronal center, the human source of all energy and vitality, a closed electrical circuit thus being established. Naturally, this circulation is visualized as persisting within the body rather than as traveling around the periphery of the physical shape. It is, so to say, an interior psychic circulation rather than a purely physical one. Stimulating Circulation let this circulation once firmly established by the mind flow evenly to the rhythm of the breath for some seconds so that the circuit has been traversed about half a dozen times, or even more if you wish, then repeat it in a slightly different direction. Visualize the vital flow as moving from the coronal center above the head down the front of the face and body. After having turned backwards under the soles of the feet, it ascends at the back in a fairly wide belt of vibrating energy. This likewise should accompany the inhalation and exhalation of breath and should also be persisted in for at least six complete circuits. The general effect of these two movements will be established in and about the physical form and ovoid shape of swiftly circulating substance and power. Since the spiritual energy dealt with by this technique is extremely dynamic and kinetic, it radiates in every direction, spreading outwards to an appreciable distance. It is this radiation which forms, colors, and informs the ovoid sphere of sensation, which is not conterminous with the shape or dimension of the physical frame. General perception and experience has it that the sphere of luminosity and magnetism extends outwards to a distance more or less identical with the link of the outstretched arm. And it is within this aura, as we call it, that the physical man exists rather like a kernel within a nut circulating the force admittedly into the system by the former mental exercise is tantamount to charging it to a considerable degree in every department of its nature with life and energy. Naturally, this is bound to exert a considerable influence so far as general health is concerned upon the enclosed kernel within. The final method of circulation rather resembles the action of a fountain, just as water is forced or drawn up through a pipe until it jets ab above falling in a spray on all sides, so does the power directed by this last circulation. Throw the mind downwards to the earth center, imagining it to be the culmination of all the others, the receptacle of power, the storehouse and terminal of the incoming vital force. Then imagine that this power ascends or is drawn or sucked upwards by the magnetic attraction of the spirit center above the crown of the head. The power ascends the shaft and then falls down within the confines of the ovoid aura. When it has descended to the feet, it is again gathered together and concentrated in the earth center preparatory to being pushed up the shaft again. As before, the fountain circulation should accompany a definite rhythm of inhalation and exhalation. By these means, the healing force is distributed to every part of the body. No single atom or cell in any organ or limb is omitted from the influence of its healing regenerative power. The circulation completed, the mind may be permitted to dwell on the idea of the sphere of light, spiritual and healing in quality, surrounding the entire body. The visualization should be made as vivid and as powerful as possible. The sensation following the partial or complete formulation of the aura in the manner described is so marked and definite as to be quite unmistakable. In the first place, it is marked by an extreme sense of calmness and vitality and poise as though the mind was placid and still. The body completely at rest 
in a state of relaxation, feels in all parts thoroughly charged and permeated by the vibrant current of life. The skin over all the body will throw up symptoms, caused by the intensification of life within, of a gentle pricking and warmth. The eyes become clear and bright, the skin takes on a fresh, healthy glow, and every faculty, mental, emotional, and physical, becomes enhanced to a considerable degree. Focusing Energy This is the moment when, should there be any functional disturbances in any organ or limb, the attention should be directed and focused on that part. The result of this focus of attention directs a flow of energy over and above the general equilibrium just established. The diseased organ becomes bathed in a sea of light and power. Diseased tissue and diseased cells under the stimulus of such power become gradually broken down and ejected from the personal sphere. The revitalized bloodstream is able to send to that spot new nourishment and new life so that new tissue, fiber cells, etc. can easily be built up. In this way, health is restored by the persistent concentration there of the divine power. Carried on for a few days in the case of superficial ailments and for months in the event of chronic and severe troubles, all symptoms may successfully be banished without others coming to take their place. There is no suppression of symptoms. Elimination is the result of these methods. Even psychogenic eruptions may thus be cured, for the currents of force arise from the deepest strata of the unconscious, where these psychoneuroses have their origin, and where they lock up the nervous energy, preventing spontaneous and free expression of the psyche. The upwelling of the libido, as the vital force is called in psychological circles, dissolves the crystallizations and armored barriers which divide the various strata of psychic function. Where organic disease is the problem to be attacked, the procedure to be followed is slightly different. One should still be under the care of a competent physician. In this instance, a considerably stronger current of force is required such as will dissolve the lesion and be sufficient to set in motion those systemic and metabolic activities to construct new tissue and cellular structure. To fulfill these conditions in an ideal sense, a second person may be requisite to his vitality added to that of the sufferer may overcome the condition. A useful technique which my experience has discovered supremely successful and a, which any student can adopt is first of all to relax completely every tissue throughout the body before attempting the middle pillar technique. The patient is placed in a highly relaxed state one in which every neuromuscular tension has been tested and called to attention of the patient. Consciousness is then able to eliminate tension and induce a relaxed state of that muscle or limb. I have found a useful preliminary in the practice of spiritual manipulation and massage with deep kneadings and effleurage, for in this way an enhanced circulation of the blood and lymph is produced, which from the psychological point of view is half the battle won. A suitable degree of relaxation obtained, the patient's feet are crossed over the ankles and his finger interlaced to rest lightly over the solar plexus. The operator or healer then seats himself on the right side of the person, should the patient be right-handed or vice versa for a left-handed patient, placing his right hand gently on the solar plexus under the patient's head at once. A form of rapport is established. Within a few minutes, a free circulation of magnetism and vitality is set up, readily discernible by both patient and healer. The patient's attitude should be one of absolute receptivity to the incoming force, automatic, should he have unwavering confidence and faith in the operator's integrity and ability. Silence and quiet should be maintained for a short while, following which the operator silently performs the practice of the middle pillar still maintaining his physical contact with the patient. His awakened spiritual centers act on the patient by sympathy. A similar awakening is introduced with the patient's sphere and his centers eventually begin to operate and throw an equilibrated stream of energy into his system. Even when the operator does not vibrate the divine name audibly, the power flowing through his fingers sets up an activity which will surely produce some degree of healing activity within the patient. His psycho-spiritual centers are sympathetically stirred into active assimilation and 
projection of force so that without any conscious effort on his part, his fear is invaded by the divine powers of healing and life. When the operator arrives at the circulation stage, he so employs his inner visualizing faculty, a veritable magical power indeed, that the augmented currents of energy flow not only through his own sphere, but through that of his patient as well. The nature of this rapport now begins to undergo a subtle change. Whereas formerly there existed close sympathy and a harmonious frame of mind, mutually held during and after the circulation, there is an actual union, an interblending of the two energy fields. They unite to form a single continuous sphere as the interchange and transference of vital energy proceed. Thus the operator or his unconscious psyche or spiritual self is able to divine exactly what potential his projected current should be and precisely to where it should be directed. A number of these treatments incorporating the cooperation and training of the patient in the use of mental methods should certainly go far in alleviating the original condition. Occasionally, since fanaticism above all is to be eschewed, medical and manipulative methods may be useful and combined with mental methods described to facilitate and hasten the cure. Although I have stressed healing of physical ills in the above, it cannot be insisted upon too strongly that this method is suitable for application to a host of other problems. This description of technique will be found adequate for all other situations which may come before the student, whether it be a problem of poverty, character development, social or marital difficulties, and in fact any other problem type of which one can think. Recapitulation, the preliminaries. Repetition is often invaluable both in teaching and in learning new subjects. Hence, some recapitulation of the various processes involved in the middle pillar practice will help to clarify some of the issues. And I should like to add further consideration which will help to render the entire method more effectual. Lifting it up to a higher plane of spiritual understanding and achievement, the final step will enable the student to call into operation dynamic factors within the human psyche which will aid in the production of the desired result. The first step, as we have seen, is a psychophysical exercise. The student must learn how to relax, how to loosen the chronic grip of neuromuscular tension in his body. Every involuntary tension in any group of muscles or tissues in any area of the body must be brought within the scope of his conscious awareness. Awareness is the magical key by means of which such tension may literally be melted away and dissolved. Only a little practice is necessary for this and skill is very readily obtained. The important conclusion following upon physical relaxation is that the mind itself in all its departments and ramification undergoes a similar relaxation. Psychic tension and somatic inflexibility are the great barriers to realizing the omnipresence of the body of God. They actually prevent one from becoming aware of the ever-presence of the life force. The dependence of the mind upon even its ultimate identity with the universal mind, the collective unconscious. The mind's petty barriers eliminated and life flowing through its extensive organization, almost immediately we become conscious of the dynamic principle pervading and permeating all things. This step is without question the all-important phase in the application of these psycho-spiritual techniques. Once having become aware of the preceding the logical procedure is to awaken the inner spiritual centers which can handle, as it were, this high voltage power and transform it into an unable human quality. Possibly the easiest way to conceive of this is to liken the spiritual part of man to a radio receiving set. The instrument must first be started with power, either from the battery or from the main before it will work. Once power is flowing through it, then the rest of the intricate mechanism of wiring, transformers, condensers, tubes, and antenna are able to come into operation. So also with man, we can tune ourselves to the infinite more readily through the mechanism of lighting up the inner centers, man's own radio tubes. When the radio set is operative, when the divine current can be shot through the set in various ways until both body and mind become powerfully vitalized and strong with spiritual energy. Prayer But all this is merely preparatory. The radio set may be lighted, the condensers and transformers and antenna in perfect operation. But what do we want to do with it? 
So also here, we need money, sickness is present, or we have undesirable moral or mental traits, or whatnot. We have so to elevate our minds in the utilization of this spiritual energy that the desire of our heart automatically realizes itself with practically no effort at all. The wish, the heart's desire, the goal to be reached must be held firmly in mind, vitalized by divine power, but propelled forward into the universe by the fiery intensity of all the emotional exaltation we are capable of. Prayer is therefore indispensable. Prayer is not merely as a petition to some God outside of the universe, but prayer conceived as the spiritual and emotional stimulus calculated to bring about an identification with or realization of our own Godhead. Prayer sincerely undertaken will mobilize all the qualities of the self and the inner fervor that it will awaken will reinforce the work previously done. It will render success an almost infallible result for in such case, success not because of one's own human effort, but because God brings about the result. The fervor and the emotional exaltation enable one to realize the divinity within which is the spiritual factor which brings our desires to immediate and complete fulfillment. But I question whether the prayer of the quite unemotional variety has any value at all here. This cold-blooded petitioning finds no place within the highest conceptions of spiritual achievement. An ancient metaphysician once said, Inflame thyself with prayer. Here is the secret. We must so pray that the whole of our being becomes aflame with a spiritual intensity before which nothing can stand. All illusions and all limitations fade away, utterly before this fervor. When the soul literally burns up, the spiritual identity with God is attained. Then the heart's desire is accomplished without effort, because God does it. The wish becomes fact, objective, phenomenal fact for all to see. What prayers, then, should be employed to lift the mind to this intensity, to awaken the emotional fervor of which it was said, inflame thyself in praying, that I conceive to be a problem to be solved, each one for himself. Every man and woman has some idea about prayer, which, when sustained, will inflame him to inward realization. Some people will use a poem that has always had the effect of exalting them. Others will use the Lord's Prayer, or maybe Psalm 23 and so on for all possible types for myself i prefer the use of some archaic hymns known as invocations but which are prayers nonetheless which certainly have the desired effect upon me of arousing the necessary emotional potential in the hope that these might be useful to others i append herewith a couple of fragments the first one being composed of vesicles from various scriptures i am the resurrection and the life whosoever believeth on me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall have everlasting life. I am the first, and I am the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. But behold, I am alive forevermore, and hold the keys of hell and death. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. I am the purified. I have passed through the gates of darkness unto the light. I have fought upon earth for good. I have finished my work. I have entered into the invisible. I am the sun in his rising, passed through the hour of cloud and of night. I am Ammon, the concealed one, the opener of the day. I am Osiris, Onophris, the justified one, the Lord of light, the triumphant over death. There is no part of me which is not of the gods. I am the preparer of the pathway, the rescuer of the pathway, the rescuer unto the light. Let the white light of the divine spirit descend. The second fragment is rather different from the above, although both have similar personal effect when slowly repeated, meditated upon, and felt intensely. The second prayer consists of two parts, the first one being a sort of petition of the higher divine self, whilst the second part bespeaks of the realization of identity with it. Thee, I invoke the bornless one, thee that didst create the earth and the heavens, thee that didst create the night and day, thee that didst create the darkness and the light, thou art man made perfect, whom no man hath seen at any time. Thou art God and very God. 
thou hast distinguished between the just and the unjust. Thou didst make the female and the male. Thou didst produce the seed and the fruit. Thou didst form men to love one another and to hate one another. Thou didst produce the moist and the dry, and that which nourisheth all created things. The second half should follow only after a long pause, in which one attempts to realize just what it is that the prayer has asserted, and that it is raising the mind to an appreciation of the hidden secret Godhead within, which is the creator of all things. This is the Lord of the gods. This is the Lord of the universe. This is he whom the winds fear. This is he who, having made voice by his commandment, is Lord of all things, King, Ruler, and Helper. Hear me and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God, the vast one, may be made obedient unto me. I am he, the bornless spirit, having sight in the feet strong and the immortal fire. I am he, the truth. I am he, who hate the evil, should be wrought unto the world. I am he that lighteth and thundereth. I am he, from whom is the shower of the life of earth. I am he whose mouth ever flameth. I am he, the begetter and manifester unto the light. I am he, the grace of the world, the heart girt with a serpent is my name. The prayer fragments are suggested only and are to be used or rejected as each student feels fit. They operate for me. They may operate in the case of other students or not, as the case may be. Non-therapeutic uses. Quite apart from therapy, there are other uses of the middle pillar technique as I have intimated above. The enterprising student will divine his own usages for it. It may be for various reasons that certain necessities of life, either physical or spiritual, have been denied one, with a consequent cramping effect on character and the onset of a sense of frustration. The latter always has a depressing and inhibitory effect on the human mind, producing indecision, inefficiency, and inferiority. There is no real necessity why there should be any undue frustration and inhibition in our lives. A certain amount of is no doubt inevitable. So long as we remain human, it is quite certain that in some measure we are likely to be thwarted in our efforts fully to express the inner self, thus experiencing some degree of frustration. But any abnormal measure of persistent sense of thwarting and frustration may be dealt with, and by these mental spiritual methods eliminated. First of all, an understanding of life is essential, and an unconditional acceptance of everything in life and every experience that may come one's way. With understanding will come a love of life, and living for love and understanding are one and the same. It will also foster the determination no longer to frustrate natural processes, but by acceptance to cooperate with nature. The methods of spiritual and mental culture have long held out hope that these inhibitory conditions may be alleviated. Poverty of a state as well as of idea is a life condition which these techniques have always acknowledged to menable to treatment. The usual method is one of such deep and prolonged reflection upon just that mental stimulus, moral quality or material thing which is wanted that the idea of the need sinks into the so-called subconscious mind. If the barriers leading to the subconscious are penetrated, so the latter accepts the idea of the need, then, so it is said, sooner or later life will inevitably attract one of those things required. But as with all therapeutic methods, there were so many instances where despite close adherence to the prescribed techniques, success was not forthcoming. It is my contention, therefore, that they fail for very must the same reasons that their healing efforts fail. In short, it was because there was no true understanding of the interior psychodynamic mechanism whereby such effects could be produced. There was no appreciation of the methods by which the dynamic nature of the unconscious could be stimulated so that the human personality became transformed into a powerful magnet attracting to itself whatever it desired or was necessary to welfare. Whether this procedure is morally defensible is a question I do not wish to discuss at length though I know it will be raised. But the answer is brief. 
whatever faculties we have are meant to be used and used for our own advantage and that of others. If we are in a state of constant mental friction, emotional frustration and excessive poverty, I fail to see in what way we can be of service either to ourselves or of fellow man. Eliminate these restrictions first. Improve the mental and emotional faculties so that the spiritual nature is able to penetrate through the personality and manifest itself in practical ways. Then we are in a position to be of some service to those with whom we come into contact. The preliminary stimulation of the psycho-spiritual centers within and then formulating clearly and vividly one's demands upon the universe is capable of attracting almost anything required so long naturally as it exists within the bounds of reason and possibility. Using the astrological structure, first of all, let me preface my further remarks by stating that from the practical point of view, the rudiments of the astrological schema are of untold value and that they offer a concise classification of the broad division of things. I'm not concerned here with astrology as much merely as it is convenient to use its schema. Its roots are in the seven principal ideas of planets to which most ideas and things may be referred. To each of these root ideas, there is attributed a positive and negative color and a divine name for the purpose of vibration. I propose naming the planets with their principal attribution as follows. Saturn, older people and old plans, debts and their repayment, agriculture, real estate, death, will, stability, inertia, positive color, indigo, negative black. Yehova Elohim is pronounced Yehova Elohim or Yehova Elohim. Jupiter, abundance, plenty, growth, expansion, generosity, spirituality, visions, dreams, long journeys, bankers, creditors, debtors, gambling, positive color purple, negative blue. El, pronounced exactly as written. Mars, energy, haste, anger, construction or destruction. Danger, surgery, vitality and magnetism, willpower, positive and negative colors, bright red. Elohim, Gibor pronounced Elohim Gibor, sun, superiors, employers, executives, officials, power and success, life, money, growth of all kinds, illumination, imagination, mental health, mental power, positive color orange, negative color yellow or gold, Yehova Eloa Vada'ath, pronounced Yehovah or Yehova Eloa Vada'ath, or Iao, as explained previously. Venus, social affairs, affections, and emotions, women, younger people, all pleasures in the arts, music, beauty, extravagance, luxury, self indulgence, both colors emerald green. Yeowa Taza Vaos, pronounced Yeowa or Yehovah Taza Vaos. Mercury, Business matters, writing contracts, judgments, and short travels, buying, selling, bargaining, neighboring, giving and obtaining information, literary capabilities, and intellectual friends, books, papers, positive color yellow, negative color orange, Elohim, Taza, Vaos. Moon, general public, women, sense reactions, short journeys and removals, changes and fluctuations, the personality, positive color blue, negative color Pus, Shaddai, El Kai. These very briefly are the attributions of the planets under which almost everything and every subject in nature may be classified. This classification is extremely useful because it simplifies enormously one's task of physical and spiritual development. It may be best if, before concluding, I instance a few simple and elementary examples to illustrate the function and method of employing these correspondences using astrological correspondences. Suppose I am engaged in certain studies requiring books that are not easily obtainable from booksellers. Despite my every demand for them, in spite of widespread advertising and willingness to pay a reasonable price for them, my efforts are unavailing. The result is that for the time my studies are held up. This delay reaches the point when it is excessive and irritating and I decide to use my own technical methods for ending it. At certain prescribed intervals, preferably upon awakening in the morning and before retiring to sleep at night, 
I practice the rhythmic breath and the middle pillar. By these methods, I have made available enormous quantities of spiritual power and transformed the unconscious into a powerful storage battery, ready to project or attract power to fulfill my need. Thus I circulate through the auric system. My next step consists of visualizing the negative or passive color of mercury, orange, so that meditating upon it changes the surrounding uric color to that hue. Orange is used because books which I need are attributed to mercury, and I employ the negative color because it tends to make the sphere of sensation open, passive, and receptive. Then I proceed to charge and vitalize the sphere by vibrating the divine name again and again, until it seems to my perceptions that all the mercurial forces of the universe react to the magnetic attraction of that sphere. All the forces of the universe are imagined to converge upon my sphere, attracting to me just those books, documents, critics, friends, and so on needed to further my work. Inevitably, after persistent and concentrated work, I hear from friends or booksellers quite by chance. So we would see that these books are available, introductions are produced to the right people, and taken by and large, my work is assisted. The results occur, however, in a perfectly natural way. One is not to imagine that the use of these methods contravenes the known laws of nature, and that miraculous phenomena will occur. Far from it. There is nothing in them that is supernatural. These methods are based upon the use of psychic principles normally latent within man, and which everyone possesses. No individual is unique in this respect, and the use of these psychic principles brings results through quite normal but unsuspected channels. On the other hand, should I desire to help a colleague who has literary aspirations but at a certain juncture finds his style cramped and the free flow of his ideas inhibited, I should alter my method in one particular point. Instead of using orange, as before, I should visualize the aura of a yellow or golden color, though the vibratory name would be the same. Again, instead of imagining the universal forces to have a centripetal motion towards my sphere, I should attempt to realize that the mercurial forces awakened within me by the color visualization and vibration are projecting from me to my patient. If he too became quiet and meditative at the same hour, my help becomes more powerful since he consciously assists my efforts with a similar meditation. But this needs not be insisted upon, for as shown by telepathy experiments, the greater part of the receiver's impressions are unconsciously received. Therefore, in the case of the patient, his own unconscious psyche will pick up automatically and of necessity the inspiration and power I have telepathically forwarded to him in absentia. The system combines telepathic suggestion with the willed communication of vital power. I strenuously oppose those partitative apologists who uphold in theory the one faculty to the detriment of the other. Some deny suggestion or telepathy and argue over-enthusiastically on behalf of vital magnetism. Others refuse categorically to admit the existence of magnetism, pressing their proofs exclusively in favor of telepathy and suggestion. Both, to my mind, are incorrect and dogmatic when insisting upon their idea alone as having universal validity or as being the sole logical mode of explanation. Equally, each is right in some respects and in certain number of cases there is a place for both in the natural economy of things the resources of nature are both great and extensive enough to admit the mutual existence of both of them and innumerable other powers also self-analysis the technical procedure is as i have shown extremely simple even where i employed for subjective ends suppose the realization suddenly comes to me that instead of being the magnanimous person I had imagined myself to be. I am really mean and stingy. Of course, I could go through a course of psychoanalysis to discover why my nature early in life had become warped so that a habit of meanness was engendered. But this is a lengthy and costly business, bad arguments admittedly against its necessity, and so much would depend upon the analyst and his relations with myself. Instead, however, I might resort to the following technique. My first steps consist of those described above, rhythmic breathing, the light shaft formulated from head to foot, and the circulation of force through the aura. 
than remembering that a generous outlook upon an attitude towards life is a Jupiterian quality. I would surround myself with an azure sphere whilst vibrating frequently and powerfully the divine name L. It depends entirely upon one's skill and familiarity with the system whether the names are vibrated silently or audibly. But by either way, powerful Jupiterian currents would permeate my being. I would even visualize every cell being bathed in an ocean of blueness, and I would attempt to imagine currents invading my sphere from every direction, so that all my thinking and feeling is literally in terms of blueness. Slowly, a subtle transformation ensues. That is, it would where I really sincere, desirous of correcting my faults, and if I did attempt to become generous enough as to perform the practice faithfully and often, likewise, if a friend or patient complained of a similar vice in him, appealing to me for help in this instance, I would use a positive color for projection. I would formulate my sphere as an active dynamic purple sphere, rich and royal in color, and project its generous healing and fecund influence upon his mind and personality. With time, the fault would be corrected to his satisfaction and thus enhance his spiritual nature, and so on with everything else. The few examples will, I am sure, have shown the application of the methods. It is not enough simply to wish for certain results and idly expect them to follow. Failure only can come from such an idle course. Anything worthwhile and likely to succeed requires a great deal of work and perseverance. The middle pillar technique is certainly no exception, but devotion to it is extremely worthwhile because of the nature and quality of the results which follow. Once a day will demonstrate the efficacy of the method. Twice a day would be much better, especially if there is some illness or psychic difficulty to overcome. After a while, the student who is sincere and in whom the spiritual nature is gradually unfolding will apply himself to the methods quite apart from the promise which I have here held out. Healing powers, freedom from poverty and worry, happiness, all these are eminently desirable. But over and above all these is the desirability of knowing and expressing the spiritual self within. Though it may be in some cases that this ideal is hardly attainable until some measure of fulfillment in other respects and on an other level has been achieved. When, however, the ideal is realized as desirable, the value of this method will also be realized as supremely effectual to that end. And that is the end of the art of of true healing, the unlimited power of prayer and visualization by Israel Regardi. This introduces some new and interesting concepts and techniques into the reality revolution in what we've discussed so far. You can find a portion of the middle pillar technique in calling down the power meditation. I use the middle pillar in that. I have effectively used this several times and there is an association with power and awakening of these centers. It's interesting because these centers differ from the chakras. We're skipping the third eye. We're skipping the sacral chakra. And remember, you have energy that's going up and down your body. And as you become attuned more and more to the energy in your body, you will become attuned to the upward and downward flow. The middle pillar exercise is really focused upon the downward flow the downward flow from above your head going down all the way through these different centers. As he says at the beginning, there are multiple systems of doing this. This is one system. This system has been tested empirically through the use of the Golden Dawn and other secret societies, and in many magical apprentices have utilized the middle pillar technique as the beginning way to achieve power. So it is important to discuss we are in a vast ocean of spiritual power all around us. So why is it we can't use it anytime we want? Why should we even need to eat? We should have unlimited energy. Our process of understanding these spiritual centers is our process of awakening our ability to interact with this intelligent energy. So this has been taught from thousands of years ago and these vibrations may even have on some level a deep knowing that you have from other lives from early humanity 
maybe have used similar sounds at the very end the astrological correspondences is very interesting it's an understanding of the archetypes of man and how we have all these different archetypes in the way that affairs change and move and you can awaken these different energies this is not a way of predicting the future with astrology this is a way of understanding the differing forces and how to utilize them in projecting outward and inward and the whole explanation is pretty interesting and i'm definitely going to experiment with that some more especially in trying to help other people as he says if we can't understand these powers energies that are moving through us we cannot be of service to anybody ourselves or anyone so if we truly want to be of service to others we need to understand this energy we might be fatigued we might we might be impoverished and be struggling in life and it may be because we have blocked these currents of spiritual energy that are flowing through us and all around us this is one person that really worked very hard on unlocking some of the secrets that secret societies had utilized in manipulating spiritual energies and utilizing magic and i always find some authenticity in his work and if you listen to those words he's not an evil man he has absolute intention to help and understand these powers i know that people have said oh israel regardi he's just an evil occultist and i don't see that in these writings it is not for everyone it's not the only way it's one way to harness this power and to develop it i think there might be something to it it's something that has worked for me and i would love to get any comments from anybody that utilized this system it is powerful and let me know there are some variations on the middle pillar and we may even read the book the middle pillar by israel regardi or portions of it because there are number of different ways to do the middle pillar we're activating these energies we're visualizing them like he says they're not parts of your body there are parts of other planes of consciousness that may be close in area to your body and how it functions we are a kernel inside of this vast egg of energy and so the more i understand these things the more i experiment with them the more clarity i get and this is some additional clarity for you so i'd love to get your comments on this system of energy and healing and if it works for anyone please leave a comment if you're struggling with something and you use these techniques and you begin to heal or heal others please put them in the comments other people want to know we want to know if this stuff is poppycock or it really works because in my own experience it's worked and hopefully we can through the application of these procedures get some empirical proof in those comments let your friends know about it put a like on the video this may save somebody's life this may turn around and transform somebody's life all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution